Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And nearly eight years ago, in November of 2011, Skyrim released as one of the largest games of its time. But over the following year or so, The Elder Scrolls V got even bigger, thanks to a stream of DLCs offered by Bethesda. The biggest of which was the game's third and final expansion, Dragonborn, which sent players to the island of Solstheim and thrusted us into the center of a conflict between the Daedric god of knowledge, Hermaeus Mora, and the first known Dragonborn, Mirak. The DLC was pretty humongous, even by Skyrim standards, offering a new playable world space around a third the size of the vanilla games and a six-ish hour long storyline not even to mention all of the side quests or extras. And you better believe that in this vast experience, Bethesda was sure to maintain that attention to detail that made Skyrim great, and absolutely loaded it with an assortment of easter eggs and hidden facts, the same kind we've built this channel off of. So, you probably know where I'm going with this one. Sit back, grab yourself an ice-cold bottle of Sunjama, and relax, as we jump right into my top 5 Dragonborn DLC secrets you may have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Starting off, Leryl Morvane is the Dunmer Counselor of Raven Rock, and, at least on paper, the Redoran Governor of all of Solstheim, though in practice he's able to exercise little power beyond his small settlement's walls. He's rather welcoming and kind to the player, in contrast to so many of Raven Rock's more skeptical residents, and Morvane serves as an ally throughout the short, served cold questline, so he's a good guy. However, something you may not have known is that back in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we actually got a chance to meet both Leryl's mother and, to a lesser extent, his father as well. Bara Morvane, his mother, was one of House Redoran's six counselors, or leaders, back in Tez III. And depending on the player's actions, she could become a rather prominent ally too, as you attempted to leverage her voting power. Notably, Bara was only elevated to the position of counselor just prior to the Nerevine's arrival on Morrowind, as her husband, Leryl's father, Remos Morvane, originally occupied the position, but was killed while defending his home from an ash creature attack. After her husband's sudden passing, Bara took on his duties. We can even still find Remus's remains at the Morvane Manor, as it will still be overrun with the beasts. The books, A History of Raven Rock, Volumes 1 and 2, introduced with the Dragonborn DLC, explains that following the events of Morrowind, Bara Morvane was eventually selected by House Redoran to lead a group of Dunmer to settle on Solstheim, and soon enough became the island's de facto leader after it was given to Morrowind by Skyrim ruling over Raven Rock until her death in the year 65 of the Fourth Era, when her son, Leryl, finally took her place. And yes, considering that Skyrim takes place in the year 201, Leryl has indeed been ruling for well over a hundred years. Dark Elves can live a pretty long time. Something else worth pointing out is that upon his death in Skyrim, Leryl is supposed to say the quote, I join you in death, father referencing his dad Remus, whose body we can again find in Morrowind. I join you in death, father. But since Leryl is flagged as essential in the Dragonborn DLC, we never get to hear that quote. At the end of the day though, it would seem that Ravenrock's counselor has quite a bit more fascinating of a family history than anyone would have thought. Let's hope we get to meet his descendants in a future title. Next on our list, Solstheim has been at the epicenter of many conflicts. Thousands of years ago, it was here that Mirak suffered his first defeat at the hands of the Old Dragon Order. Back in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's Blood Moon DLC, it was the setting of the Daedric god Hercene's Wild Hunt. Now, it's in the middle of Hermaeus Mora's jockey for power with the original Dragonborn. The poor locals have suffered quite a bit as is. But, it would appear that there may have been another war fought on this small chunk of floating land that Bethesda hasn't elaborated upon much at all. A secret war, if you will. Let me explain. Way back in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, one radiant conversation we could hear randomly between just about any two characters went like this. 
One NPC would say, quote, There are rumors that the Nords are attempting to capture the whole of Solstheim and remove the Imperial Fort on the island. To which another character in the conversation would respond by saying, quote, I'm not surprised. It seems that Skyrim is always involved in a border dispute. End quote. Now, this is rather significant, as it suggests that while Tez 4 is taking place, Nords are battling for control of Solstheim. Yet, at the same time, such a conflict doesn't make much sense. Like, at all. For one, this dispute is never referenced in the rest of Oblivion, or Skyrim for that matter, it just doesn't exist. Furthermore, at the point in time we hear this conversation, Solstheim was already officially a part of Skyrim, ruled over by the Jarl of Hafingar. It wouldn't be until the eruption of the Red Mountain, around a hundred years later, that Skyrim's High King relinquished control, giving it to the Elves. Additionally, also at the same time we witness this dialogue, Skyrim was a part of the Empire anyway. So Skyrim's forces attacking an Imperial fort would be a massive deal. It would effectively be an act of rebellion, civil war. Surely we would have heard of this somewhere else. One possibility is that perhaps what the characters meant to say was that it was the Skull Nords revolting. Solstheim is home to a large native population of Nords, who have lived on the island for thousands of years, largely independent of both Skyrim's crown and the Imperial throne. They call themselves the Skull. Maybe these people were the ones attacking the Imperial fort, trying to take over for themselves. But even then, the characters explicitly say that it's Skyrim involved in the dispute, making this explanation unlikely. Again, I can't stress enough, there's no other references to this event anywhere. No books talk about some Nordic war for the island, nor do any characters in the Dragonborn DLC mention this evidently failed uprising. So perhaps the rumors of it in Oblivion were just that. Rumors without much truth. Or maybe there's something that the histories are hiding from us. Coming in at number three. Tel Mithrin is a fungal fortress located on the southeastern coast of Solstheim. It was built and is currently inhabited by Neloth, a master Telvanni wizard from mainland Morrowind, who offers the player an assortment of side quests, and even serves as a strong ally during the expansion's main quest line. When entering the central structure of Tel Mithrin, its biggest mushroom, you will be prompted to float up the stem to the living area via a strange magical levitation pad. It's pretty neat. Levitation magic never really makes an appearance in Skyrim or any of its other DLCs for that matter, so seeing it used here is quite novel. At first though, one may not think very much about why we can experience this type of flying in the Dragonborn expansion, but not the vanilla game. I mean, in all likelihood, it was probably just a product of the devs wanting to do something fun for the DLC. However, there's actually a really good lore reason for why we can do a little bit of levitation on Solstheim, but never get the chance to in Skyrim. That reason is called the Levitation Act. You see, in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, levitation and flying were things that the player could really easily do. There were spells for it and everything and it made getting around the map considerably faster and easier. However, when Bethesda released the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, that entire school of magic was dropped, primarily due to engine limitations and the sheer amount of pressure flying around so fast would put on the game. To give this change a lore-friendly justification, Bethesda created something called the Levitation Act. The Levitation Act, as we learned during the events of Oblivion, was allegedly a law passed by the Empire just prior to the start of that game, which outlawed the use of flying spells and levitation across all Imperial territory. Since Skyrim is a part of the Empire, and there's no evidence that act has since been repealed, it makes sense that in the Elder Scrolls V's base game, we never get to see any of these types of spells. But, since Solstheim is not a part of the Empire when we visit it in Dragonborn, that means levitation and flying magic is perfectly legal here. Hence the reason Neloth is able to feature it so prominently in his humble abode. 
Again, the real reason we can't use it in the game is mostly due to engine limitations and technical issues. But it's fun to know that Bethesda baked a different answer into the game's lore. For fourth spot, it's back to Tez 3 yet again. Man, I've just realized that this script is filled with Morrowind references. Anyway, the Blood Moon expansion on Solstheim featured a quest the player could receive by a Breton mage named Louis Beauchamp. He would claim to have recently commissioned the construction of an airship using some rediscovered Dwemer technologies. After getting the ship built and hiring a crew, he sent them off in search of some ancient artifacts, but hadn't heard back in quite some time. Louis would ask that the Nerevine determine exactly what happened to his vehicle and the men serving on it. Eventually, the quest would lead us to a crash site on a mountain near Hrothmund's Barrow, where we would find what remained of the airship and the bodies of its crew members. Evidently, the vehicle got sucked into a blizzard and suffered a, shall we say, unfavorable landing. We would simply have to report the bad news back to Louis to complete the quest. Well, in the Dragonborn DLC, there exists a large Reichling encampment at a place known as Mosring Pass, right about where that airship crashed in Blood Moon. And sure enough, at the center of this goblin settlement is a structure we can enter, called Strange Vessel. There's not too much of significance inside, but sure enough, this is almost certainly the very same patchwork airship featured in Morrowind. It's still here even after all these years. I suppose no one ever really got around to cleaning it up, and some Reichlings decided to move in. It's just a shame that flying contraptions aren't more prominently featured in the Elder Scrolls franchise. Let's keep our fingers crossed for the next installment. And finally, last on our list, oh, this one's very interesting. Solstheim might be moving. So, normally on any map we look at, the island of Solstheim appears just off the northwestern coast of Vardenfell and Morrowind. This is true for any map we see in the Elder Scrolls 3, 4, and 5. However, maps featured in the Elder Scrolls Online bear a striking difference. In ESO's maps, Solstheim appears directly north of Skyrim, particularly just north of the hold of Eastmarch. It's literally moved between these titles. Now, this odd difference in the island's placement has stirred up quite the conversation in the community. Some suspect that it's simply due to a mistake by ZeniMax Online Studios, the developers of The Elder Scrolls Online arguing that they just made a bit of an absurd error. But others suggest that maybe the island has genuinely been shifting around. ESO takes place literally over a thousand years prior to any other game we see Solstheim mapped out. So in a world of magic, and possibly some confusing tectonic plates, it's possible the entire island itself could have shifted around quite a bit in between all of that time. I should point out that Solstheim itself originally formed after it broke off from mainland Skyrim a few eras ago during Mirak's original failed rebellion against the Dragon Cult. Maybe it's still trying to find its footing, so to speak. ZeniMax Online has thus far just not commented on what's happening. Like, at all. They haven't stated whether this is simply a mistake by them, a developer retcon, or what's going on. Which honestly leads me to suspect that the place is indeed moving. You would think if they made an error so egregious, it would have been corrected by now, or at the very least addressed. To think that this entire landmass could slowly be shifting all across Nern is really interesting, and it leads me to question where it might end up next. Will it continue going further and further east or north? Will the climate get colder? What will happen if this is all true? Whatever's really going on, only Solstheim knows, and Solstheim isn't telling. And with that, we are going to wrap up my top 5 Dragonborn DLC secrets in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. I do hope you all enjoyed. Which of these Easter eggs or facts did you find to be the most fascinating? And what tiny details do you know of on Solstheim, or in Skyrim in general? Leave a comment down below. 
As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. A very special thanks to patrons and channel members for helping me do this for a living. And I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.